new message and I'm changing what the old message said. Vola. That's you're claiming it's a cult for everyone else in all of history except for Paul. I feel responsible for their soul. And there's fear that I'm going to let them down, you know? It's hard being a prophet. Yes, it's hard being a prophet. This is Michael Beverly. Thank you for checking out my channel. We are looking today at Melissa Doherty's explanation of what a cult is and without irony, how you as a Christian can use critical thinking to make sure you're not in a cult. But all of this also taught me a lot about cults. What are they? What makes a cult? What are the methods they use? Why do people fall for this? And so much more. Okay, the first thing is there is no agreed upon definition of what a cult is. There are some general ideas. If you look in the dictionary, it'll, it'll say things like a small group that has a high control um, philosophy with, with a leader who is elevated, like above everyone else. Um, the thing historically about cults is a lot of groups that start off as what most people would agree as a cult, or would agree that our cults, once they grow to millions of members and gain some acceptability, and maybe they tone down their message a little bit, are then accepted as just another religion. Some people use the definition of a cult of any religion they don't agree in. So I want to just lay a quick ground rule. What what I'm I I am in generally accepting Melissa's position on what a cult is. I'm going to I'm going to show some clips here in a second on what I think we all agree are cults and then we're going to dig into the weeds just a little bit more. It was a bunch of people that you could tell really loved each other. It was a very caring environment. The rapid rise and fall of Rajneesh Puram is a tale so outlandish, so far-fetched that it's difficult to believe that it happens at all. Some people say this business is a cult. But the couple denies this assertion. They claim their organization is devoted to spiritual wellness, relationship guidance, and self-love through connection to one's twin flame. In our minds, the police, even the President of the United States, had no authority over us. Warren Jeffs is our president. He was the prophet. And how could you place a human over God. Approaching millennium has fanned the flames of a curious phenomenon, UFO cults, a synthesis of mainstream religion and cutting edge science fiction. Before you judge us, make sure your own life is clean. Would you In 1984, the followers of Rajneesh Puram orchestrated a bioterror attack in Oregon in order to try to outcome a vote. They sprayed salmonella and they essentially uh, poisoned about 750 people. When it comes to domestic terrorism in America, most people think of 9-11 and the Timothy McVeigh bombing. The, Raj, the Rajneeshi Puram 1984 organ attack could have been seared into American memory had it had it end up killing as many people as it got sick. Thankfully, the outcome wasn't as bad as it could have been, but it underscores what a cult group under the direction of a leader can accomplish in terms of violence and destruction. Of course, most of us are familiar with the types of mass suicides that came with Jonestown, the Heaven's Gate cult. Going back to 1857, Mormons orchestrated a the Meadow Mountains Massacre in 1857, resulted in the death of at least 120 members of the Baker Francher immigrant wagon train. This massacre was organized because Mormons were trying to control the territory. The reason I bring that up is there's an interesting thing about how Mormonism is viewed today. So I, I was watching a Mike Winger video where he kind of said Mormonism has kind of slowly migrated to becoming more mainstream. In other words, they've dropped certain 
doctrines or teachings such as polygamy, um, the teachings that they used to have about black people, which would not allow a black person to become, you know, go into the temple and become whatever, you know, rank of person because they were considered to be cursed and so forth. So Mormonism has changed. Now, one of one of the clips that we just watched was the fundamentalist Mormon movement. So in Missouri, there's still fundamentalist Mormons who practice polygamy. There was also a group, I believe, that moved, that migrated south to Mexico. So we don't have, we generally don't have an argument when it comes to Jim Jones and Heaven's Gate and the Branch Davidians. It gets a little bit more weird or a little bit more argumentative when we look at things like the, the Twin Flames universe. So the clip the clip about the twins, the twins flame universe, is talking about a couple that that started this online group and they're still active, where they pair people up. And one of the things that they do is they tell people, "Oh, well, you're not really a man or you're not really a woman. You're supposed to you're supposed to change your gender, your identity, and and then they they would sit they would try to push people together who obviously weren't meant to be together and, and i watched a documentary on them and it was just fascinating how long it took some of the members to actually get out of the cult so that's a lot about that uh, that type of cult is that type of cult is a thing that melissa is going to talk about a lot high control groups that are very destructive and can often lead to violent acts they can lead to losing your money. Um, they sometimes control members to cut off their family of origin and so forth. I learned that critical thinking is quite important in aligning your beliefs with reality. I learned that there are very smart and very wonderful people that get taken captive by cults. So I thought I'd make a video telling you the things I learned from people much smarter than me in hopes of helping you become smarter. I've learned that critical thinking is quite important with aligning your beliefs with reality. I've learned that there's very smart and very capable people that get taken captive by cults. So I thought I would make a video. So I thought I'd make a video telling you things that I learned from people much smarter than me in hopes of helping you become smarter. So let's start with the basics. What makes up a cult? I hear lots of people throwing around the word cult like people do the word love or narcissism. It's just sort of lost its meaning because it's so overused and misunderstood in my opinion. First, let me just tell you what a cult is not, all right? Someone that has different beliefs than you does not equal that they are then in a cult. This is probably the correlation I hear the most and it's just simply not true all the time or even fair. If anything, this is a fallacy to just dismiss what the other person is saying and an easy and lazy way out of not having to think about your own position. Silly dog, I'm busy. Hey, hey, come here. I start talking about cults and Christians. And, whoa, silly dog goes crazy. Yeah, and who's in control here? Not me, not me. Okay, sometimes Silly Dog gets out of control, but he's a good boy for the most part. So, what I would like to point out here is that if you go back in time to, say, just prior to Constantine declaring Christianity a, an official religion, that it was just one of many cults. Like, I think that's a fair characterization. And I also think it's a fair characterization to say that when the early Christians started worshiping Jesus, when, you know, before Saul became Paul, those early Christians were considered part of a cult movement. Like, I get what you're saying, but it's it's just when we start, and I'm agreeing with Melissa, when we start using words like that, they they tend to lose their meaning. However, the origin of the Catholic Church, as well as Protestants and so forth, is is a group that could be that would fall in the definition that even even today, if a group started like that, we might very well call them a cult. When when Martin Luther started Protest Protestantism, 
it's not as if the Catholic Church said, oh, it's just another church. No, it was viewed as a aberration and as a false movement. Now, when these when when new groups start up and they're considered false movements and they're ended through either violence or attrition over time, then we look back on them in history and say, oh, it was just a cult. But if it grows into a bigger movement and it becomes mainstream, then it changes, it changes how we view it. Second, a cult isn't just some small group of people in a house far, far away with tinfoil hats on and Kool-Aid in the fridge. The scary truth is that anybody can be involved in a cult. Okay, so Melissa and I are in agreement here. Anybody can be involved in a cult and, it, and intelligence, like being a smart person, doesn't necessarily protect you. So this is why I, I quite often pontificate on the fact that without a good methodology, without a unbiased methodology, and without critical thinking, using that methodology without presuppositions, you won't know if you're believing things that are false, untrue, and that, and let's be honest here, it's entirely possible to be in a big acceptable, like, like church or religion, whether it's Mormonism or Hinduism or Islam or potentially particular Christian denominations are all of Christianity that you could be in you could be in a movement that's not true so the same methodology that you would use to find out if you're in a cult if you're in something that's potentially dangerous and and potentially life threatening though those those questions you would ask in that critical thinking can equally be applied to a very nice church where everyone is loving and kind and your life's not in danger and you're not in a high control situation, you're just in something that's false. And I would hope that everybody would want to know if they're giving their time, money, and energy to something that's false, even if it's nice. Now, if you accept that your religion is just a club and it's, and it's not dangerous and it's not hurting anybody, well, that's different. Then carry on with your life and peace be upon you. Really, really intelligent people have been involved in cults, but there are actually specifics for what makes up a cult. They're characterized by several key elements that set them apart from mainstream groups. First, they typically feature a charismatic leader or more who possesses qualities like charm, confidence. They're hilarious. But are you strong enough to point that? high-powered perception of yourself. Are you, Christian listener, willing to point that high perception at yourself? Is Melissa willing to apply the same standard she uses to determine what is a cult on her own belief system? Paul by all the definitions she just said, was a cult leader. Now, obviously, Christianity developed into what's now considered a mainstream religion. But it wasn't that when it started. Now, was it? Even the most fundamentalist apologist doesn't claim that Christianity start out, started off with millions and millions of members and in and a highly organized church system. No, it started off with a very small group of people who were followers of what appears to be an apocalyptic preacher. And those followers believed that, that Jesus was, you know, these, these doctrines took a while to develop, but the general idea is that he was not only the son of God, but that he was God and that he had died for the sins of man and through the blood atonement, forgiveness of sins could be accomplished. Now, Paul was persecuting the early Christians that most historians and most people that look at Paul's letters don't dispute that Paul was a persecutor of the early Christian church and then was converted through some means of 
a revelation or a vision. Now, if you're a skeptic, you'll say like a hallucination or some sort of non-supernatural event happened. And of course, if you're a Christian and you're and you you know you believe in the supernatural, you believe in the spirit, you believe that Jesus actually presented himself to Paul and said, "Hey, why are you persecuting my church?" But in 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 nobody's story, it does Paul get installed into this existing organized mainstream church and from i think everybody's position if if there's a position that doesn't agree with this i would like to hear what it is everybody's position is that the main that what was mainstream at the time in judaism was um you know the 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 temple system and the priests and so forth and that they considered the early Christians a cult. That's why Paul was persecuting them. So was Paul powerful? Was Paul charismatic? Was Paul intelligent? And did Paul use rhetoric as well as threats to establish his authority? I say yes. Let's hear what some other people have to say about Paul. I want you to think about this for a moment, my Tatalo. My sweet brother, listen, think about it. What possible conundrum, monumental problem does this present to the church? And not to any church, but to the church that Paul fashioned. The problem is in Pauline theology, none of this is possible. Okay, pay attention, Christians, because what the rabbi is going to explain here, and it's not the only example, it's just one of many examples, where Paul makes up Scripture out of thin air or changes Scripture and twists the meaning that the Hebrew Scripture, the Tanakh, presents. So if you believe if you believe in the Abrahamic God and you believe in the, you know, the Holy Bible is inspired by God, you have a problem because Paul has done all the things that Melissa has just described and will continue to describe in her talk that a cult leader does to a T. Paul fits what Melissa describes as a cult leader exactly 100%. Now. Are you willing, now Melissa also says critical thinking is important. Are you willing to apply, just like uh, Clarice asked Hannibal Lecter, are you willing to turn the mirror around? Are you willing to put that highly perceptive analyzation on these other people that you know are cult? Like it's real easy to say, oh, David Koresh is a cult. Are you willing to use the same methodology, the same logic with no double standards, no special pleading, no saying, oh, well, it doesn't apply to my guy. Are you willing to apply the same standard to Paul? Keep listening. If, if you're afraid to study your own scriptures, well, that says a lot about your faith, doesn't it? The rap, like, I know if you're a Christian, you don't agree with the Jews, but don't tell me the rabbi doesn't know the Tanakh, because I guarantee you, is Melissa going and learning Hebrew at her seminary? I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. I highly doubt your pastor knows Hebrew. So unless you're afraid, stick with me here and listen and hear out the arguments. In Pauline theology, there is no effort of mankind, there's no repentance that man can achieve where he can bring about his own salvation. Let me talk to people who have been to church. Okay? Your works can't save you. I'd just like to jump in here real fast. This, this dovetails in with an, with an old teaching of Christopher Hitchens, who I know many of you guys all hate Christopher Hitchens, and you all think he's in hell. Look, he what he said, though, it's pretty hard to deny. Christopher Hitchens says you can have somebody else pay a penalty for you. Like, you could send someone else to the gallows for you. You can have somebody pay your fine. But nobody can take away the responsibility 
responsibility for your actions. There's nothing you could do. To, God is up here. He's righteous. You're a sinner. There's no work. And this is what you hear in church. This is church talk. And, and the good thing about my listenership is a very significant number of them are former Christians or Christians. Very large, very significant. So I can't be making, I'm not setting up a straw man here. I'm not presenting or uh, Christianity in a way that's unfavorable for my, my desire to embarrass the church. No, I'm not mischaracterizing Christian teaching. That's exactly what every Sunday you are told in a church. So this presents such a conundrum for Paul. Why? Because in, as far as Paul is concerned, nobody's repentance can bring about their own salvation. You can't become righteous because you turn back to God. And therefore, I beg you, please, you know what I tell you sometimes? I say, please open two Bibles. And if you're a Christian, you really want to do this? When I was a Christian, I did not do this. When I was a Christian, I did sometimes get out the parallel Bible because I wanted to see the difference between, say, the King James and the NIV and maybe what the Living Bible said, etc. But I never went back like, and, and really dived into what the Hebrew Scriptures said and meant. And I also didn't do what Bart Ehrman recommends, and that's compare scene to scene. I tended to go through, like if I was reading Mark or reading Ephesians or reading whatever, I would read that or study that. But I didn't go through and say, oh, I want to see the baptism here, the baptism here, the baptism here. And then, of course, John doesn't have the baptism. So when you study the Bible in that way, it all of a sudden illuminates things and you go, whoa, wait a second here. So I really highly challenge you. If you're a Christian and you have never done this before, pay attention to some of these teachings from Rabbi Singer or any other rabbi that understands the Tanakh because it's very, very re revealing. And you start finding out that the church has either misled you, lied outright, or in some cases they've just ignored things and not talked about them so that you hear something and you go, whoa, I didn't know. Really? I didn't know that. Because I don't want you to take my word for it. Let's let's stop doing that, okay? And those of you who have a favorable view of me, I'd like you to suspend it because I want you to see it for yourself. And if you're a Christian, just be prepared, not based on pray of the Lord. No, just look and you'll see what the author of Romans, the most important letter of Paul, does with Isaiah chapter 59, verse 20. What does he do? He says, and this is Romans eleven twenty six, and this is how Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come to Zion, and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. What happened? It doesn't say that, my friends. It doesn't say that the Messiah is the, the Goel, that's the Redeemer, is going to remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is a scam. This is a scam. This is what a cult does. A cult takes, a, takes teachings and twists them to their own ends. Now, I know as a Christian, you're saying, no, 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 the rabbi's wrong, and, and Paul was inspired. And Okay, if Paul was inspired and Paul's words are true, then that undercuts the Tanakh, and it means Isaiah was a false prophet. So you got to pick a lane here. Can't have it both ways. Now, if you didn't catch what I said, what I just explained— we, I want to just look through this very clearly because I'm not being picky. <laughs> this is a massive issue. Okay. Tanakh teaches us that you could repent right now and Hashem loves you and he's ready to take you back into his arms. Return to me and I'll return to you. That's all. Now, look, 
I, I am a Jew by birthright and genetics, but I'm not a Jew spiritually in the sense I believe in a God. I'm an atheist. However, however, if you were to ask me to pick what was most logical and made, and the, made the most sense, and I, and I had to pick a religion, I would, I would start asking myself, what is logical based on, like, if I accept things as being prophecies or if I accept things from being teaching from a God, what would be most logical? And I, I just bear with me a second and go through. Let me just let me go through. Let me go through a simple analogy. I'm just asking you to use the critical thinking that Melissa said was important and use your own heart here. You have children. Let's say you have four or five kids. One of them does something wrong. Doesn't matter what it is. Your child comes to you and says, Mommy or Daddy, I'm truly sorry. I repent. I, like, I know what I did was wrong. I take personal responsibility. And I am sorry. And in some cases... You might expect the child to say, like, I'll, I'll make restitution or I'll, I, will, I will submit myself to, to your punishment or I will, you know, I will do what I can to, um, to, like, to repay. Let's say your child ate your other child's cookie or something and you would say, okay, I'm going to give – I'm going to take one of my cookies and I'm going to give it to my little brother and I'm, I'm going to apologize to him and – and mommy and daddy, I'm sorry that I broke your rules not to steal cookies. Okay? Now, as a good loving parent, if you believed your kid wasn't, you know, a sociopath liar or something, you would forgive them, right? Tell me you wouldn't forgive your kid. If your kid honestly came to you and said, mommy or daddy, I am sorry and I take responsibility and I made a mistake or, you know, I lied or I cheated or I... You know, I broke some of your rules and I acknowledge your rules are, are good. Like maybe the kid snuck out the window and went to a party or something. Would you forgive your kid? And I, I submit most of you have to say yes here. Now, here's the alternative. Little Johnny comes to you and says, Mommy, I stole the cookie of my little sister at lunchtime. And you say, okay, that I understand. Hold on a second. And you take your oldest son down into the basement and you slit his throat and he bleeds out. And then you go back upstairs and you say, Johnny, you're forgiven now. I've slit the throat of your brother. I have shed the blood of an innocent. So you're so now you're forgiven. And it doesn't even matter whether you want to make restitution. It doesn't matter if. You're taking personal responsibility. In fact, it doesn't even matter if you're actually really sorry that you stole the cookie. What matters is that you actually believe that I slit the throat of your brother and he bled out for you. Because blood is what makes the blood is what causes the forgiveness of the sin. Now, which of those two is more just? is more logical, and which of those do you, if you're a parent, which of those which of those models do you follow? And if you're a child, which of those models would you want your parent to follow? So do you see what I'm saying here? Paul came along just like a cult leader and changed the story of an existing religion or existing an existing system of of rules and laws and spiritual truths for his own reasons, whether it was power or personal gain. Um, you know, I don't know if it was for access to women or not. Maybe sometimes I think when I read the stories that Paul might Paul might have been homosexual a homosexual and that was the thorn in his side, but that doesn't matter. It, what it, what matters is that you can recognize that the system that Paul instituted not only violates the Tanakh, it, it not only it not only 
twist Isaiah's words. It goes against everything that you would accept and believe for a fair and just system in any other domain. Imagine if your government came to you and said, we have caught your child shoplifting, but don't worry, we've slit the throat or we've crucified or we've put in an electric chair an innocent person. And as long as you believe we did that, your son is free. Would that make any sense to you? Of course not. If you're a critical thinker and you're fair and logical and you understand that special pleading and double standards and twisting the words of something you claim is God inspired to meet a different new teaching. If, if, if you can't see this, like I'm not asking you, you know, I, I don't think I can just talk for a few minutes and you're going to say, oh, yeah, you're right. I'm not a Christian anymore. I, I get that. But I want you to listen to Melissa's words and take to heart what Melissa's saying and then apply it to your own system and apply it to Paul. And then ask yourself, how is it that I'm making excuses for Paul and I'm making exceptions for Paul and I'm excluding my own church and my own Christianity and my own beliefs from all these things that I apply to the other guy? One of the surprising things that await any student of the New Testament when they study the text academically, whether at university or uh, uh, at home reading academic texts, is just how unorthodox and heretical the earliest Christian uh, beliefs were compared to the later beliefs of the church. OK, you are going to have to wrap your mind around what he just said. What he's saying is that the earliest Christian church had beliefs that look through the lens of today. In other words, people like Melissa's view, going to an American seminary, would think all the early Christians were heretical. Now, before you balk and say, no, 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 that's not the case, remember, Paul's letters and Paul's epistles come sometime after the very earliest Christians were Christians. Otherwise, who was Paul persecuting? He was persecuting somebody, this group. What did that group... Now, remember, they didn't have Paul's letters yet. Paul was not even a Christian. He, didn't, he wasn't writing letters. He wasn't part of the way, right? So he was persecuting them. What were those, like you could call them proto-Christians or the proto-church Christians or pre-Paulinian Christians? What did those Christians believe? And if you understand what those Christians believed, and then you look at what Paul changed, aha, you'll realize Paul was a cult leader who completely twisted things and completely changed the doctrines of the very earliest Christians, the ones that were following the teachings of Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, I came not to change the law, but to fulfill the law. There's only one conclusion, and that conclusion is Paul was a cult leader, and that Christians today, I'm not saying you're in a cult, you're in a mainline church, but you're the foundation of your beliefs and the foundation of your church is Paul's cultish, anti-Orthodox, and extremely anti-Jewish position. Pay attention to the rest of what this teacher is going to explain. Now, he's reading from a book, and I'm sorry, this is a, this is a little bit third party, but again, don't take my word for it. Don't take this teacher's word for it. And don't even take the, you know, the, the, the teacher, the, the scholar of the book that he's reading's word for it. But take the information and then go back to the sources and study it for yourself. Critical thinking. Don't have a double standard that critical thinking is only good for the other guy. And I just want to share with you what some of these beliefs actually were, because uh, they are, I found them quite surprising when I first uh, read about them. And I'm going to use as my guide, Jimmy Dunn's book, Unity and Diversity in the New Testament, an inquiry into the character of earliest Christianity. 
And Jimmy Dunn, as I've said before, uh, is a leading New Testament scholar, professor at the University of Durham. And he says in his book, uh, page 255, under the chapter, just how orthodox was earliest pa Palestinian Christianity, he says the following. The first Christians were Jews. Luke's account of the range of nationalities present at Pentecost, this is uh, the great falling of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, where they, where they all receive the Holy Spirit, people from all the nations of the earth apparently are congregated there, but they were all Jews and proselytes. In other words, they weren't Gentiles. These were uh, committed people committed to Judaism. And even though they believed that Jesus was the Messiah and risen from the dead, that did not alter their standing or outlook as Jews. And Dunn continues. Okay, are you, are you following this? The earliest Christians were still Jews. It wasn't going to be until later when Paul shows up. And if, if you study the history of this, you'll see that Paul had a lot of disputes. And there's disputes. Even today, you know, modern scholars will argue about like, who really wrote Second Peter and did Peter and Paul's division actually get resolved? Or did Paul just end up dominating like a cult leader and change the material that he needed to change so that later, looking back on it, it appears as if there was agreement when in fact there wasn't. They apparently continued to observe the law without question. This is the Jewish law, the 613 commandments given to Moses not interpreting their traditions of Jesus's words and actions in a manner hostile to the law. Nothing in what they understood about Jesus' teaching told them to reject the law. Hence the Pharisees seem to have seen in them little or nothing of the threat which Jesus had posed, Acts 5.33 onwards. And not a few became members of the Jesus sect while still remaining Pharisees, Acts 15.5.21.20. And just a quick interjection here, the later Gospels, when they would present certain things, like when Jesus healed the withered hand, now besides the fact that healing the withered hand is, is a basically almost a cut and paste from the healing um, that either, I can't remember, Elijah or Elisha um, back in Kings heals a withered hand. It's, it's basically, it's just copying that story. But the Gospel writer presents that that healing of the hand as being a reason for the conflict between the Pharisees and Jesus. And there's other examples. Well, guess what? Those are anacrostic. If, if those things actually happened, the Pharisees, there's a little, in other words, there's a lot of things that the gospel writers get wrong because the Pharisees wouldn't have had a problem with certain things that Jesus did. So that's a different study, but it's it's very instructive if you look at if you look at the things that are anac that are anacrostic, meaning that somebody later put something back in the story that doesn't fit because the at the time that they're making that story, they're trying to make the story plausible. They're using something from a different time, and so they get it wrong, and they don't realize it because you know sometimes people think well. Uh, it would be like it would be like writing a story. It'd be like writing a thriller mystery set in the 1970s and then putting a smartphone in it. You would. That's the kind of mistake that the gospel writers make. In in various places. Hence, too, the shock of the Cornelius episode to the Jerusalem believers. It had not occurred to them that faith in Jesus the Christ might make the purity law irrelevant. So they had no understanding from Jesus that he had abolished the law or made what was unclean clean in regards to food at all. He continues, they evidently continued to be firmly attached to the temple, the Jerusalem temple, attending daily at the hour, hours of prayer, Acts 2, 46 and 3, 1. In short, he says, it is evident that the earliest community in no sense felt themselves to be a new religion distinct from Judaism. This is a really important point. It's also very important to remember that the early Christians believed 
that the return of Jesus to fix everything was imminent. Now, this will later be reflected in Paul's writings as well. So what you'll notice as, as the church and the teachings evolve over time, they got to mansplain why Jesus didn't come back. Today, after 2,000 years of Christian tradition, we think of Christianity and Judaism as in completely separate and independent religions. But actually, the earliest community after Jesus ascended into heaven were Jews, practicing Jews, and within the Jewish faith. There was no sense of a boundary line drawn between themselves and their fellow Jews. They saw themselves simply as fulfilled Judaism the beginning of eschatological Israel, and the Jewish authorities evidently did not see them as anything very different from themselves. They held one or two eccentric beliefs, so did other Jewish sects, but otherwise they were wholly Jewish. Indeed, we may put the point even more strongly. Since Judaism has always been concerned more with orthopraxy than with orthodoxy, right practice rather than right belief, the earliest Christians were not simply Jews, but in fact continue to be quite orthodox Jews. Now, as a Christian, this should be blowing your mind if you've never thought about it and never studied it. The earliest Christians were orthodox Jews. And then Paul came along and Paul had battles with Cornelius and, and Barnabas and Peter and Paul was seen in various lights and eventually these battles were won and this is this is also true with like er, other early church leaders or you know other early maybe even you would want to call them other cult leaders like um, and i'm not i don't want to say he was a cult leader i don't i don't know enough about him but marson's teachings were later considered heresy and unorthodox and so forth so from the perspective of the early, early church fathers uh, Mar Marson was a cult, right? But Paul wasn't considered a, a cult because he won the battles. He won the battle for orthodoxy, and he did that by going to the larger world, bringing in the Gentiles and changing and changing Judaism into something else. Never mind that the early Christians were Jews. Now, there are other people who point out the contradictions and the lies of Paul. Let's listen to a couple of them because they're instructive. Paul is someone who I'm not sure, and no scholar that I've spoken to is sure, what happened with Paul. Was he a saboteur? Was he a saboteur in order to disrupt Christianity or what the followers of Jesus were doing from within or was he just fooled by Satan on the road to Damascus when he thought he saw Jesus that we cannot answer whether it was blatant or whether he was fooled but one thing we do know is he destroyed the teachings of Jesus he told people to break the law in Galatians he commanded them to break the law he said the law is cursed and Jesus was cursed on behalf of it to remove it from us and Jesus said anybody who breaks the law and tells someone to break the law they are the lowest person in the kingdom of heaven so Paul either was a saboteur or he himself was fooled and duped but even when Paul met the disciples of Jesus when he met Barnabas they had a falling out because Barnabas said hold on a second what you're teaching is not what I heard from Jesus and I saw the man myself and he fell out with the other disciples when they got to know him and Jesus and Paul when he returned to Jerusalem at the last part of his life Paul returned to Jerusalem does anyone know what the city of Jerusalem did they all came out to kill him they all came out to kill him and the guards of Caesar came and got him and protected him and took him away and that was the end of what we know about Paul. So Paul did not really see eye to eye with the disciples nor the followers of Jesus at any point. It was the later churches and the letters that were. Now, I know as a Christian that you're not going to give a lot of credence to an Islamic teacher. But what I want you to what I want you to listen to and what I want you to critically think about is if you got Muslim teachers and Jew teachers 
all telling you the same thing about Paul. Like it doesn't that doesn't mean it's true, obviously. But they're not just pulling this stuff out of the thin air. They're not just making up stories. Now, now some of the stuff that he just said, uh, this teacher, like I, like I don't know if he's got all the history right, and it doesn't matter because I'm not trying to say this guy is completely right or this guy knows everything about this. But what he said, what he said about Paul changing the teachings of Jesus and the early Christians is in line with New Testament scholars like the one we just listened to and is in line with rabbis like Rabbi Singer who say, look, Paul's teachings contradict the Tanakh. They like change the message. So again, you can't have it both ways. If you believe that your holy Christian Bible, which includes what you call the Old Testament, which the Jewish Bible, if you believe that the Bible itself is God's holy inspired word, then how do you reconcile when Paul comes along and changes things? In other words, when Paul does the exact same things that Melissa's defining as what a cult leader does. Now, if you're going to, if you're going to listen to somebody like Melissa and say, yeah, okay, I under, you know, I agree that this is what cults do, and this is going to help me pick out. Like I can see right away, David Koresh, cult leader. I can see right away, Joseph Smith, cult leader. And look, you might even want to say Muhammad was a cult leader. So th that if that's your position, fine, but follow the same standard. If all of these later teachers who came in and changed things are cult leaders, then by the same standard. Paul was a cult leader. Paul, Saul of Tarsus, another man who never walked, who never talked, who never met, who never ate, who never prayed, who never knew Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? Now here we find four writers and another one between them that wrote all the New Testament books that never talked, never walked, never ate, never prayed, never met the man called Jesus Christ. Now, I'd like to point out that modern scholarship does not apply Paul's authorship to every epistle. Um, and when he says five writers, yeah, modern scholarship agrees there's more than five writers. Yet in their words, the first mentioning of the Trinity came from where? From Jesus or from them? The first mentioning of Jesus being divine, a man God, came from whom? From them. The first mentioning that Jesus is the Son of God came from whom? From them. Jesus never said in his own words any such words, but it was the men who never met him, who claimed to have written, who didn't know their last names. And Paul, by the way, before he had that vision on the road to Damascus that only he saw and only he heard, guess what his occupation was? Do you know? He was a bounty hunter. Okay, I would, also, I'd like, to, I would like to also point out that modern scholarship, it, there's not a consensus on what things Jesus actually said. There's some belief there's a Q document which recorded the sayings and the oral traditions of the things Jesus taught. From the spectrum of, yes, Jesus was completely historical and the Son of God, and he really roasted it like the most fundamental belief all the way to the most extreme belief that Jesus was just a myth. Somewhere in there is the likely truth, but we don't actually know, we don't have enough information to know exactly what the words are. but. Um, this this Islamic teacher is not wrong in what he's in what he's saying that the beliefs like the these doctrines like the Trinity and the divinity of Christ were added later. And this is clearly in line with teachers like Bar Ehrman, which I know Christians like to hate on Bar Ehrman. But just read just read and tr and understand it and do it with without a preconception, and you realize all of a sudden that 
a lot of these doctrines, just like this Muslim teacher is saying, he's not lying there. They were added later. So in line with what cult leaders do is they come in and they assert their authority. They assert their power and their control and they have a story and they make sure to rub out, push out competing stories so that their story can become dominant. Now, in the case of Paul, the early church fathers, when we get into like the second and third centuries, they latched on to Paul's teaching and they, you know, certain books were canonized and that became orthodoxy. But that does not mean that it was orthodoxy pre-Paul. So whatever you want to think about an Islamic teacher, he's not lying to you here. This is in line with modern scholarship. And even the most fundamental Christian can't come in and say that, that they have documentation and proof that, that these things existed pre-Paul. And certainly you can't argue the Trinity existed pre or, you know, it didn't exist in early Christianity. The early Christians were Jews, I guarantee you. They did not believe in the Trinity. And they weren't eating pork. A hunter of Christians hunting them down like animals, binding them and bringing them to where? To Rome so that they could be executed. Now, if Hitler, after killing thousands of Jews, said that on the road to Berlin, he had a vision that he was named an apostle to the Jews, and he wrote 20 books that all the Jews are supposed to follow. Do you think they would be following that book? Well, he's got a point there, you gotta admit. Now, I don't know if his history is exactly right that Paul had thousands of Christians killed, but it doesn't matter for the story's point, even if he just had one or two, or even if it was just Stephen. Paul was persecuting Jews who were Christians, right? Remember, the, the early Christians weren't Christians, as you know, Christians. They were Jews who had some unique and unusual beliefs, perhaps. And Paul at the very least, was overseen and part of killing one of them. But whether it's one or thousands, or it's probably the reality is somewhere in the middle. It doesn't matter. He was murdering other Jews that had these odd beliefs, perhaps. Okay, so the point here is the character of Paul, the character of Paul, by his, by the by the admission of the of the New Testament itself was he was a murderer and he was a bad person now the story goes the story goes that you know he receives this vision but think about it is there witnesses to this vision that we can rely on is there outside attestation well no so just like a cult leader Paul comes in. This is no different from what Joseph Smith did. And Mormons will tell you, well, there was witnesses to the, to the story, right? Mormons will tell you that. They'll say the golden plate story is believable because blah, blah, blah. An apologist in Islam will tell you that there was witnesses to the things that Muhammad did that, that undergird the stories that Muhammad and peace be upon him. I don't mean any disrespect to Muslims. I don't agree with your theology and I don't agree. I don't agree that Muhammad was a prophet any more than I believe Joseph Smith was a prophet or, or but that Paul was a prophet. My point is the stories are all very similar when you have somebody that comes along and, as, and asserts authority and a control and, and let's Let's take Melissa at, her, Melissa at her word that she that she's got these criteria for what a cult leader is. Characterized by several key elements that set them apart 
from mainstream groups. First, they typically feature a charismatic leader or more who possesses qualities like charm, confidence, they're hilarious. And Paul fits that box. So in order to say that the that the the evolution from early Christianity or proto-Christianity to what became orthodoxy, like in order to plead that, that that wasn't a cult, that Paul didn't form a cult and that cult, Paul wasn't a cult leader, you have to special plead. You have to make exceptions. You have to make excuses. You have to explain. You got to explain why those, those criteria and those means of, of, you know, the using critical thought to determine who's a cult leader. Oh, that doesn't apply to Paul. He's a special case. Come on. Now, this is the Paul who has rewritten the life of Jesus Christ and said to us, one, Jesus said, I came not to change and alter the law. Whose law? The law of Moses. Not one jot, nor one tittle, till heaven and earth shall pass away. No one must change or alter the law. Now, of course, it's conjecture that, that Jesus actually said that. But Christians have a problem because they believe Jesus said that, because it's in the Bible. And then Paul came along and changed everything. So you got to do a lot of word salads, and a lot. And I know you can. I know you apologists can explain all this away. But remember, critical scholarship understands and teaches and believes that the earliest people who became Christians pre-Paul were Jews. I don't, I don't even think that's that controversial. They certainly couldn't have been following Paul's epistles as they weren't written yet. Now, Paul said he came with a new covenant. Paul said he came with a new testament. Paul said he came to the Gentiles and that they no longer had to, those that followed Paul, they no longer had to observe the law of Moses. What was the law of Moses? The Ten Commandments. They no longer had to. They could eat pig's meat. The Jewish people today, following the law of Moses, they can't eat pig's meat. So how could Paul change that law and tell them they could eat pig's meat? Paul said they didn't have to circumcise all Muslims. All Jews, all of those that follow the prophets are circumcised. How is it that Paul said they don't have to be circumcised? Paul said they didn't have to observe the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath is one of the commandments, one of the Ten Commandments. And Jesus said, when they asked him about, Jesus said, do you know which is the greatest of all the commandments. What commandments was he talking about? He's talking about the commandments of Moses. He said, do you know which was the, is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy mind and all thy soul. This is what Jesus said was the first of the commandments. Because that commandment from Moses was, hear ye, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. And thou shalt not worship anyone except the Lord thy God. And thou shalt not bow down to any graven images in the heavens or in the earth or in the sea below. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God. And thou shalt not worship any gods along with him. That was the first of the commandments. But Paul said we didn't have to observe that commandment. And it was through the epistles of Paul that Constantine later on, 300 years later, he decided to reconcile this new Jesus at the Council of Nicaea to be specific in the year 354. It was Constantine that reconciled Paul's Jesus from the historical Jesus and decided that he would go with Paul's Jesus and kill everybody else. 
And that's where the Trinity was born. That's where the incarnate God was born. That's where the atonement was born. That's where the idea of Jesus Christ being crucified, dead and buried for three days and coming back was born. This is where the idea of Jesus being God was born because Constantine accepted that idea. He might not have all of his history correct. I, I don't know. And it doesn't matter for the purpose of what I'm trying to get across here. And again, I'm not trying to be a teacher and say, believe anything I say. But I think it's very powerful when Muslim teachers can point out the stuff that Paul did that was deceitful and tricky and then how that was later picked up by Constantine or the government or the what became the Holy Roman Catholic Church, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it is in line with what a Jewish rabbi will tell you. So you have the you have these Muslim teachers and these Jewish teachers saying, "Hey, look. Here's what the Tanakh said. Here's what the early Christians pre-Paul believed as Jews." And then here's these new teachings that Paul brought in, fought for, and established. And it's there you can't argue that the church, the Christian church, wasn't transformed and changed after Constantine. You, you just can't. So Con I'd like to point out here, part of the reason I like to use Islamic teachers is because I know this is triggering something in Christians and they're like, no, 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 the, Islam isn't true. They change things. They have a new message. Here's my challenge for you. Make two lists in your mind or write it down on a piece of paper of what Paul did and what Muhammad did and tell me how they're different. Both of them came along and said, God came to me and I have a new message. And throw in Joseph Smith. Throw in anyone that you claim is a cult, whether it's David Koresh, Jim Jones, Joseph Smith, Muhammad, or any other leader that said, God has given me a new message and I'm changing what the old message said. Vola. That's, you're claiming it's a cult for everyone else in all of history, except for Paul. Now, how is that logical, fair, or reasonable? It's not. It is not. And hence, we find uh, in the New Testament uh, statements about uh, uh, Paul saying, for example, that uh, God came down, humbled himself, became Jesus, Philippians uh, chapter 2, the Carmen Christi that uh, uh, Nabil spoke about. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 6, uh, Paul takes the Shema Israel and he makes uh, two persons out of that one. In the Shema Israel, there was only one Lord God, and now Paul makes it one Lord and one God. One Lord Jesus, one God the Father. He splits them. So uh, we know the Hadron Collider has split the atom recently. Now Paul did a splitting way back when. Uh, but Paul is representing one particular view here. And the view of Peter and er other early disciples of Jesus did not survive to be written for us in the New Testament. We do have two documents that are named 1 Peter and 2 Peter, uh, apparently letters of Peter, written in Peter's name actually. But according to Martin Hengel, these are pseudonymous uh, works which means that somebody else wrote them using Peter's name. Why would they want to do that? Well, one reason is that if you look at 2 Peter, you will see that 2 Peter praises Paul and speaks of him as brother Paul and speaks about his letters as if these are scriptures on par with the scriptures of God. What these scholars are saying is that somebody who is a follower of Paul, wanting to show Paul in a good light, and wanting to show that Peter accepted Paul, wrote this in order to promote Paul. When we read Acts of the Apostles, which is a sort of history book in the Christian New Testament, we get the idea that there is a, a, a rapprochement between the various sides. Paul on the other hand, on the one hand, James now on the other hand. Uh, Peter has now gone off somewhere else. 
Why has he gone off somewhere else and we're not even told where? According to Martin Hengel, this is uh, Luke's way of uh, uh, bringing people on stage, taking them off stage. That's why we have the pageants, uh, uh, you know, based on Luke's gospel at Christmas time, right? Luke is good at that, bringing people, taking them off stage. So Peter just goes off elsewhere. We don't know where in, in, in the Acts of the Apostles. We have to find that information elsewhere. And then James becomes the leader of the church. Who is James? It's mentioned as the Lord's brother. Uh, James now is shown to be the brother of Jesus. Now, of course, anybody that studies and follows along in this space knows that there's some argument about exactly, you know, looking at Gary Habernas's minimal facts and, you know, who exactly was, was James and when exactly did James become a believer? When, when, when did James become... Uh, hey, silly, be quiet. Hold on a second. Paul comes to Jerusalem. When he comes to Jerusalem, James puts him to the test. Are you still following the Jewish laws? And to pass the test, Paul pays for the sacrifices of those who had entered into a vow. And he himself goes into that sacrificial routine. Now, th these, uh, this is a couple of decades after Jesus has already said to be died on the cross. And Christians think Jesus died on the cross, that means a new uh, dispensation has been entered. Now we do no longer follow the law. And Paul himself in his writings seems to be saying we don't need to follow the law anymore. We have a new dispensation. But he comes to Jerusalem and what is he doing? Following the law, right up to the extent of performing the sacrifices, which we are told that the one sacrifice of Jesus did away with forever. Now what's happening here? Luke is reconciling and showing us that they are in agreement. But according to Black's New Testament uh, commentaries, uh, it seems hypocritical for Paul to behave in this way. So either he didn't behave in this way, and Luke is just making it such, or perhaps he is all things to all men, as he said himself, in order to win them uh, to Christ. But when we look at this, we see that there was a division, and the early Christian apostles who followed Jesus, their message did not survive. Their group survived as a group called Ebionites, named after Matthew's uh, statement, apparently, where, where Jesus says, blessed are the poor. So they were called the Ebionites, the poor ones. But their movement died out within the first uh, few centuries of Christianity. What did they believe? They believed not in a triune God, but they believed that Jesus was uh, a prophet and a messenger of God. They believed in only one God, as Muslims today believe. This was the earliest belief. So what happened? If one of the things you can read is, is Bart Ehrman's Lost Christianities, or you can study other sources. What were all the early factions and divisions, and what did they believe? And what did Paul do to establish his authority? And how is it different from men, and in some cases women, who established a new teaching and a, and a new idea using claims of special revelation and using manipulation, coercion, threats, manipulation of money in people's minds, whether it's Mary Baker Eddy, Judge Rutherford, the followers of L. Ron Hubbard, whether it's Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, whether it's Muhammad and the early followers of Islam, um, or any other offshoot that came out of a Judeo-Christian or Abrahamic God belief, and of course, if you go worldwide, the number of the number of cults is in the thousands. And you have the Moonies, and you have um, there's the cargo cults that that sprung up after um, World War II, where where villagers had they had watched these planes come in with cargo, and uh, they they built these cults and they thought, well, they, they built these towers and they put, you know, like radio antennas up and they called out to these, to the God, they, these studying these cargo cults is rather fascinating. So what happened? Well, you know, people believe weird stuff and people are susceptible to um, tricks of the mind and manipulation and, and coercion. And people also want to be cared for and loved and feel special cult leaders take advantage of those things 
if you're claiming that Paul was different, then the onus is on you to say why. Why was Paul different from all these other? And you can't use the circular reasoning argument. Well, Paul is different because Paul said he was different. You just have to read what Paul said. That's like me writing down this napkin religion's true. It says right on this napkin. Come on. You can't you you can't accept Paul's testimony that he's that he's true just because he said he's true. And the the fact that Paul that Paul's teachings were eventually adopted by a big giant government institution and what you know what these Muslim teachers are pointing out is the the winners killed off the other groups and we know the early church destroyed burnt got rid of a lot of old documents and that, that we know about only because of the early church writers wrote polemics against them so they you know they quote things that say this is a heresy this is a heresy so we know they that we know those heresies existed but we don't have the uh, the group's original writings well why well because the the winners write history and the winners got rid of the losers so it's just it's just like a modern cult and the, and here's another thing I, I i really want you to think about in 2000 years or 1800 years from now it's very possible that the mormon the lds church will have a half a billion people or maybe even a billion people and they will look back on their history and deny they were ever a cult and that they ever had weird teachings and they will say we're orthodox we're a church we're orthodox and our views are legit how is that different from what Paul did. How is Joseph Smith different from Paul? I submit to you, he's not. Joseph Smith came along. I have a new teaching that God revealed to me. Nobody else, him. Paul came along. I have this new thing that God revealed to me and testifies to me, and I'm the boss, i.e., a cult leader who used manipulation distortion, lies, threats, coercion to get his way. That's what formed what is now Christianity today. Second, another aspect of cults is they often adhere to an exclusive belief system. Okay, my fellow Christians, did you hear what she just said? Let me read from Galatians. But even if we are an angel from heaven, so in other words, if Gabriel or the, any angel comes down and should preach a gospel different than the one we preach to you, and by we, Paul means himself and those that are his followers, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, and now I say again, this is Paul speaking, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be under God's curse. So, by Melissa's own words here, we know Paul is a cult leader. Paul is preaching an exclusive gospel. And where did he get it? Where did Paul get it? Great. Hold on a second. Before, before I, before I, um, before I quote from Paul, let me quote from Joseph Smith. Okay. Hold on a second. Okay. This is what Joseph Smith said. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. And I want you to know, brothers and sisters, this is Joseph Smith talking, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it as a, releva a revelation from Jesus Christ. Okay, so Joseph Smith was very... Oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. <laughs> Pardon. I, I was actually still reading from Galatians. But guess what? Do you, do you, do you notice that what jo the things that Joseph Smith said, and this could apply to any other cult leader, including other re you know people that start new religions, whether it's Muhammad, whether it's Joseph Smith, whether it's David Koresh, Marcion, other early 
um, sects and factions of Christianity, guess what? They say the same thing that what Melissa's just now said. This is the sign that you're that you're in a cult when you're following somebody that says, "I have a special revelation." The gospel I preach, it's not of human origin. It, I received it not from man, but I received it from, from God. And how can and, and why should you believe me? Because I'm telling you. I'm telling you should believe me. And guess what I'm also telling you? I'm telling you if you listen to anyone else, you're cursed. Come on. Double standard, anyone? Special pleading? If you're fair and consistent, you have to admit that Paul matches all of the criteria for a cult leader who's come up with a new teaching. That includes extreme religious doctrines, conspiracy theories, uh, apocalyptic prophecies. If Melissa was writing the script for a satirical comedy, she couldn't do much better. Extreme, extreme teachings is the very definition of what Paul did, which is why he had conflicts with other leaders in the church and other early Christians. Paul completely changed hundreds, maybe even a couple thousand years of tradition and teaching, and he wiped out the beliefs of all the early Christian groups that he had, he had just previously been persecuting because they were Orthodox Jews. Now, they, they did believe Jesus was the Messiah, and they believed in Jesus' eminent return, like any day, to set things right, to remove the Roman oppression, and to usher in the new kingdoms and the new earth. Now, Paul also stuck with that belief, but he changed pretty much everything else. He changed the words of Isaiah as Rabbi Singer pointed out, there's no denying that. He changed the idea that God's law still applied, like the eating pork and the Sabbath and fo following the law and circumcision. Paul changed all. Is that not extreme? That's, as, that's like as extreme as you can get in terms of changing doctrine, like for Jews. Like, oh, by the way, you can now you can eat shrimp and pork and you don't have to get circumcised and you don't have to obey the laws of Moses anymore. Is that not like, come on. Paul fits this criteria to a T. He was a cult leader and he used his power and his authority and his intelligence and his charms and his and he used coercion and threats to establish a completely new gospel, a completely new message. And if the words, if some of, if, if some or all of the words of Jesus in the gospels are actually things Jesus said, Paul came in and just wiped out the teachings of Jesus, just like the Islamic teachers said in a few clips ago. Because what did G Jesus said? I didn't come to abolish the law and Paul just wiped it out. So I ask you, is Melissa wrong here? Or does what is what Melissa's teaching apply to every cult leader in all of history, the thousands of cult leaders, except for Paul? He's the exception. Por qué? Members are sometimes isolated, either physically or psychologically, from the outside world, and it fosters a dependency on the group for social and emotional support. Control over information is another hallmark of cults. They tightly regulate access to outside information and discourage critical thinking. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention from the previous clip is that one of the signs of a cult is this um, apocalyptic mentality. Well, Paul fits that to a T. Paul was telling people, don't even get married. The end is near, like the end's coming. Like That's the one teaching that it seems Jesus taught that the early believers taught that Paul kept. Now, as far as controlling information, are you freaking kidding me, Melissa? Do you even know church history? Do you? Can you be honest? 
What do you think the early church fathers and the early church did? They burnt, destroyed all competing um, gospels and books that they could find. And the little bits that survive today and the and the quotes we know from polemics against those teachings in the writings of church fathers is how we know about how many competing ideas there were the people that competed with with Paul's teachings so in terms of controlling information are you freaking kidding me and all the stuff you just said applies to pretty much every modern church just toned down a little bit and I know when I started questioning things the church that I went to the pastor and I'm like this is anecdotal but this story is this is often repeated the head pastor issued a, a rule to the staff you know the paid staff they were not allowed to speak to me I had a I had somebody that was I considered like a friend the, my mom was a pastor on staff and this it, she wasn't at the time at the time of this going through my mom was off staff but she had a, a pastor that was on staff who asked me like what my beef was and I said I'd love to talk to you and she said okay well we'll we'll sit down and have a lunch meeting and then very shortly after that she said no I'm not allowed to speak to you this is the last communication I'll have with you I was completely blackballed blacklisted and given the silent treatment now I understand with more extreme cults that that dynamic happens more in a more extreme way. I get that. But it happens in the mainline churches too. Maybe not to the extreme that it does with, you know, highly, highly controlled smaller groups, but it still happens. Cults exercise behavior control as well, dictating sometimes daily routines. Your relationships, who you can talk to, even dress codes. There are also thought control tactics, such as thought stopping and black and white thinking. Melissa, 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 is, is the truth not in you? Or do you honestly not see how fucking ridiculous the things you just said are? Have you ever been to Sunday school? Are you paying attention at your own seminary? You don't think modern Christianity controls information? Now, now it's true. That, you know, it's true. Like at most mainline churches, you don't have a pastor telling people, you know, congregation, you may not read Richard Dawkins or you may not read Christopher Hitchens. And I don't want you on YouTube listening to, you know, ex-Christians and so forth. Like, I, okay, I get that. I do get that. It is more extreme in a lot of what we would call cults. But are you fucking kidding me? You th do you think the average pastor, the average church is is promoting critical thought? And I know that they don't. And one of the ways that I know for a fact that they don't as a rule, besides being part of it for 38 freaking years, is I just have to listen to people like you, Melissa, straw man the other side continually. Listen to any Christian apologist on YouTube and you will hear rhetoric that proves beyond any doubt they have no fucking idea what the other side actually believes or thinks because they can't, for, for the most part, they cannot steel man the other side, whether the other side is atheism or whether the other side is Catholicism or whether the other side is Judaism or whether the other side is anything mormonism or, or muslims or any, any christians control information and other like it's not a, like a it's not like a rule like if you go to if you go to your average evangelical church you're not going to have to sign a document saying i promise not to read any books by richard dawkins and i promise not to listen to the atheist experience or the prophet of zod or you know anybody on you know or myth vision or anything on youtube that that's going to go against me. like yeah okay that but it, but these controls are done and they're still done they're, they're done in ways in which people that ask questions are kind of labeled troublemakers and they're sort of dismissed and especially the young come on it's almost as if the things that you just said melissa are like a comedy like a satire, it's 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 almost to that extreme because 
everything you're saying applies to Christianity to some degree. And it, I mean, it would actually be laughable funny if it wasn't so sad. Do you even hear yourself? I don't think you do. I, I, I think that if, I think most Christians listen to something like this, what I'm saying, and it just goes right over their head. But I know there's a few of you, and part of the reason I do this, I know there's a few people out there. And they're going to hear something and it's going to trigger something in the, in their head. And then they're going to say, wait a minute, that, that makes, that makes a little bit of sense. And I'm just like Rabbi Singer said, I don't trust me and listen to me because I say so go read it for yourself. Just like Rabbi Singer said, get out two Bibles side by side and I understand most of you, probably 99.999% of you have no idea how to read Hebrew. You can go online, you can get tools, and you can look at the Hebrew, at the Tanakh, at the actual Bible, not the Greek Septuagint, not a Christian apologist interpretation. Go Since you guys believe the Bible is holy and inspired, go to the Tanakh, go to the original Hebrew, and compare it to the liar Paul. And tell me, who do you believe? If you believe Paul's lies, you're admitting that you're in a cult. You're in a cult. Uh, you're in a cult that came out of Judaism. You're in a Jewish cult. And every and every argument you use against these vicious cults, like the Branch Davidians and Joseph Smith and other religions like Islam, every single argument applies equally to you and equally to Paul. And if you don't see that, you're just special pleading and you're a hypocrite. At least admit it. At least admit it. At least admit that you, like, you can't deny the facts. Like, Go check them for yourself. Not asking you to trust me, but I'm saying this is, this is what you'll find if, you, if you're willing to use your brain and you're willing to read for yourself. That's what you'll discover. Uh, both of these are used to manipulate members' thoughts and beliefs. And then there's emotional manipulation, which is employed to keep members obedient with fear, guilt, shame, promises of love and acceptance. This would be sad. This would be heartbreaking sad if it wasn't so sickening, sickeningly, sickening and funny at the same time. Well, it is kind of heartbreaking. Do you hear what you just said, Melissa? Promises of love and threats and control of behaviors and so forth. You have just described uh, with 100% accuracy the entirety of Christianity. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And nobody gets to God through me. Have you read Luke 1927, where Jesus explains what happens to the unbelievers. And this is kind of a parallel with uh, what, what Elijah did to the worshipers of Baal. They took them down to the river and slit all their throats. It's the same teaching Jesus gives there in Luke. Bring the unbelievers before me and slaughter them. Have you read any of the Christian doctrines on hell, Melissa? Are you fucking kidding me that you're going to accuse cults of using threats and fear and mind control? Are you kidding me? Or, or are you going to special plead? Threatening children with hell is evil and terrible when it's done by anybody except for my church. Woohoo! Woohoo! I got the right church! Woohoo! All you other motherfuckers are going to hell to burn. Oh, but I'm not using threats. I, I'm using love. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. But he's gonna send all those other people to burn forever in hell, and I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna be in glory. Melissa, are you listening to yourself? Everything you just said is undeniable proof that Christianity as a whole 
is a cult that can, tries to control. I mean, come on. These are essential doctrines of Christianity. Who you can sleep with. What kind of sex you can have. What, what kind of behaviors are acceptable. And what happens to you if you don't believe. You are tortured for eternity. Or in some of the nicer forms of Christianity, you're just annihilated. Yes, Jesus loves me. But Luke 19, 27 says all the people that don't believe like I do will be slaughtered by the sweet Jesus. Come on, Melissa. Don't be a fucking hypocrite. Turn that perception you have for all these evil cults and apply it to Paul in your own beliefs. And guess what? You'll, you'll leave the church. Listen to some rabbi singer. Maybe you want to be a Jew. I listen to some Muslims. Maybe you want to be a Muslim. At least the Muslims and the Jews are monotheists. Because one sign of knowing that Christianity is a cult is the Trinity doctrine. It fits everything you just said about cults. Mind control, exclusivity. You got to believe, you have to believe what I'm teaching you. And where did I get my doctrine? Well, God gave it to me, Paul says. Come on. You're in a cult, Melissa. You're in a cult. You can get out. You can save yourself. Doing the very things that's, that's so super ironic. Actually use critical thinking, Melissa. Actually use critical thinking and use the same standard that you use to dismiss all those other dummies who are being tricked. Who you now you admit intelligent people could be tricked because like we we all admit it can be emotional trickery. We can get sucked in. We can believe stupid things. And maybe I'm wrong as an atheist, and maybe I should be a Jew and accept that God's real. But I certainly wouldn't be a Christian. Because it's obviously a cult. And why do I know Christianity is a cult? Because I just listened to what Melissa told me what a cult looks like. And it fits Christianity exactly. You're in a cult. If you're a Christian, you're in a cult. Get out. Uh, those are common tools. Now I'm going to elaborate more on each of these through what's called the bite model, which is control over behavior, information, thoughts, and emotions. This was developed by a man named Stephen Hassan, who is a cult expert, um, and he has a very interesting uh, story and background of being in a cult himself called the Moonies. You might have heard of them. I respect much of his work and find it to be very valuable. And when I first learned about this model back in the day, I actually thought it was quite brilliant. Mind control was my favorite thing to teach on when I talked about the Jehovah's Witnesses and was always the first thing I started with because I needed Christians to understand why Majeda was so resistant to facts, even if it was presented to them right in front of their faces, yet still flat out rejected it. Just wow. When we in the skeptic community present facts to you, Melissa, and your Christ fellow Christian, you flat out reject them because your mind has been subjected to mind control. Everything you accuse the Jehovah's Witnesses of being either guilty of doing in the leadership or victimized in the, in the pew applies to your church and your beliefs. A hundred percent. One hundred percent. You are, Melissa, describing yourself, but you're blind. You're, you're, you're blind to it. And my challenge to you is drop your presuppositions. Tell yourself, and if you're a Christian and, and, and you want to know the truth, like this will bolster your faith and make you a stronger Christian if it doesn't help you deconstruct somewhat. In either case, it's going to help you think. If, if so, if you're a Christian or if, Melissa, if you're listening to me, drop all your preconceptions. Because if you go into a discussion with already having the answer, you can never learn anything. And I'm always willing to do the same. I'm willing to say I could be completely wrong. 
I could be completely wrong. And, and atheism is is a is a bad like not believing is the bad choice. So like it, remember, atheism isn't a belief. Atheism is a rejection of belief in a god. But that could be wrong. Like I there there could be good evidence for a god. I like I don't see it, but maybe somebody could present evidence to me. Are you willing to say, are you willing to say, I could be wrong, at least about something. It doesn't even have to be about God. Let's not argue about whether there's a God or not. Let's just say, could I be wrong about some beliefs? Maybe it's something as, as, you know, like drinking alcohol, where, you know, there's different, different arguments. Or maybe it's something a little bit more strong, like eating pork or the Sabbath or child baptism, or women in the ministry, those kind of things. Are you willing to say, I could be wrong about some of my beliefs? If you can say yes, unless you think you are just the smartest person on the world and you have every doctrine and every belief right, and you can admit you could be wrong about some things, the question is, what methodology could you use to find out? Well, you've got to start off without presuppositions. And if you do that to the extreme, you will say, okay, maybe there's a God, maybe there's no God. Let's investigate. Let's investigate without bias and with, without coming into the discussion. Okay. And if we grant, okay, so let's let's say that we we grant for the sake of argument, okay, the, there's a God. What would what would we expect to see? Right? Like what how would we expect the world to be different and so forth? And we might say, well, maybe if there's a God, he'd send us a message. That, I mean, that's the belief of most religions, right? So how would we determine how would we determine what message is the true message? Because there's a lot of competing messages, right? Well, if we use all the things that Melissa has just gone through, and like I'm I'm gonna end this just in a few minutes here. I'm not gonna go through her whole video on this bite method, but I challenge you just apply that bite method that this teacher that she respects who escaped from the Moonies, just use the same thing, you know, like behavior control and mind control, et cetera, et cetera. Just apply that to Christianity. So if we say, if we say, hey, let's look at, let's look at Judaism. So if we go back to before the time of Jesus, right, and we wanted to worship and believe the truest thing, and we believe in the Abrahamic God, there's no Paul, there's no Muhammad, there's no Jesus yet. If if you if you're a Christian, you have to say, yeah, I would be a Jew because that would that's the 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 revelation that that is the most true right if you believe that so i'll grant that to you let's grant that the abrahamic god is real and that judaism is the, is the best representation of belief in god and that god's rules for that time so let, let, let's put ourselves back at you know year zero or year a few or even we could even put ourselves at 10 ad or 10 ce whatever you want to call it you know before jesus's public ministry has started and, and, and we're Jews, right? Let's put ourselves, let's imagine we're there. And then what happens? Well, somebody comes along named Paul and he does all these things. And we want to test whether it's, whether it's legit. Let's use the criteria that Melissa has outlined to know whether something's a cult. And let's do that fairly and honestly. Conclusion. Paul was a cult leader. There's there's no other logical way around this unless you special plead and you say, yeah, Paul's visions and Paul's revelation, even though it contradicts Isaiah and other and Zechariah and the Psalms and all kinds of stuff, and even though it can contradict and even though it contradicts the words that we think Jesus said, like I came to fulfill the law, not not do away with the law. Even with all that, we still accept Paul. And we have all these rules, yada, 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 controlling information, manipulation, coercion, threats. If you don't believe, you're going you're gonna to burn, you're going to go to hell. But, oh, but if you accept everything, you'll be loved. Come on. If you can honestly listen to somebody like Melissa explain how we can know how to condemn all these cults as false things and you can with a straight face you can say yeah melissa's right when she's talking about the j-dubs when you give them facts it bounces off their brain because they've been indoctrinated and brainwashed and mind controlled those poor jehovah's witnesses but not me 
Woohoo! I got the truth. I'm in the right church. Come on. Let me close with quoting from the Princess Bride. We are both men of action. Lies do not become us. Friends, don't be duped by cult leaders. We are men of action. Lies do not become us. <laughs>